in, in giving this talk, which the slides I did for last night, um, I thought long and hard about this because the, the pr talk I gave yesterday was sort of, was really let fly and see where we end up. Um, but this talk, as those who read the Drover's Journal would realise, I was not apprehensive about giving it, but I was apprehensive about what the content would be because it seems to me, as I said yesterday, if we've got a group of people who travel all around the world to come together at a function such as this, whilst the camaraderie, etc., is critical to it, there's also got to be a degree of honesty. And the question that Judy put to me to talk about now is where to with shorthorns? And it was a little bit of a conundrum because if it wasn't looking too bright, how do you actually say it's not looking too bright, etc.? So what I did, I want to meet people, talk with you, and just get a feel for it and listen to the speeches and the, the various addresses that came through and, and get a sense of where we're going. So. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is how I see it, rightly or wrongly. First quote I want to use is one by Napoleon, that leaders are dealers in hope. And that's what we've got to be. And I'm treating you as leaders of your countries, if, insofar as short on cattle, obviously. Um, because the message you take from here back to your country is going to dictate to a certain degree or greater degree what happens in that country with our, with our particular breed. So first of all, let's have a look look at shorthorns. Now until Ted spoke this morning that was valid but Ted sank my story a bit because South Africa has gone back. Um, but having said that and seeing this as a family then it's up to the family when one member's struggling a bit it's up to the rest of the family to pitch in and help. So I think we've really got to be trying to help the South African shorthorn breeders in, in a number of ways get that market share back again and market share was what I was alluding to yesterday. But by and large our product we've maintained our market share or we've increased it to a, a greater or lesser degree. One of the things that frustrates me is that Breeders of our breed are invariably nearly apologetic about breeding shorthorns. You go and ask a crowd of people, what do you breed? And the shorthorn breeder invariably will be the ones who breed shorthorns, instead of saying with pride. And yet you look at the bottom of that sticker there, all those, and I've got the good professor here to pull me up with a jerk if I'm wrong, but all those traits on the bottom of that slide are all traits that make money for producers. You've got fertility, marbling, growth, docility, mothering, milk and carcass all absolutely key traits to making a dollar out or peso or whatever out of, out of beef. And yet we've got the product but we, we nearly apologise for breeding it. We've got to get on the front foot team, you know, we've got to make this thing happen. And, and listening to the talk yesterday, um, I forgot which one it was, but with marbling, you know, Angus breeders rabbit on ab nauseam about the great marbling ability and, and I noticed this morning when Kerry was talking without even pausing in his breath he just said Angus and Shorthorns have got the marbling ability. Now he knows that because he's been working with them at Mount Lincoln, Mount Lytton, but we, we haven't picked up on that yet. In Australia, with the EU, which has much to do with the marbling market, we've still got to get our fellas to get their bums into gear to appreciate that fact and start marketing it. So the question then coming back is, so what needs to be done to correct this situation? And I think there's three things. We have to create leadership, we've got to tell the story, and I think there's a far greater role for the World Shorthorn Council. So taking the leadership content first, I mean, one of the perils of leadership is that sometimes you've got to do things that aren't necessarily popular but you've got to do them to make it. And I'd like to publicly acknowledge now, as, as many of you would realise or have heard, there was a the family in Australia got a bit ruckus with each other there a couple of years ago and had a brawl. And except for the fact that Richard Ham took over as president, the short on breed in Australia wouldn't be there. Simple as that. The old saying, cometh the man, cometh the hour, was the case with Richard. Now he's a pretty laid back, quiet sort of bloke. He's next banker, so he, he always looks at dollars instead of everything else. But without Richard's leadership and guidance through that pretty hairy couple of years, I, wasn't, I only came on the board in Australia last year, so the, when all the shit hit the fan, I wasn't there. Um, which is a bit strange for me, I normally see be in the middle of it. Um, but it was Richard's guidance that got the breed through and has got shorthorn beef back on a level keel financially as well as other things. We've got a lot to do, admittingly. Uh, but I just really wanted to, to acknowledge Richard's leadership because I think the history of shorthorns in Australia down the track will treat him a lot better than probably the history of shorthorns is at the moment. The other thing we have to do in Australian leadership is sit down and, and work out how shorthorns all come together, keep their own registries but we come together. To me it is absolutely ludicrous through the eyes of a commercial breeder to go to a royal show and see 
Australian shorthorns, beef shorthorns and shorthorns being judged and trying to convince them they're different breeds. It's all bullshit. They're all the same cattle. They've got horns, they've got different traits or whatever. So we, in Australia, we're going to sit down and do a bit of that. Leadership, I think, also involves driving people. You've got to have people to drive it. You can't, uh, can't sit back and just wait for things to happen. A uh, very good friend of mine who's a vet who's also very cynical reckons he knows what dog's going to come into his, into his surgery when he looks at the owner. He reckons people and dogs look the same. And I think we've got, as shorthorn breeders, we've got a lot of the traits of shorthorn cattle. We've got docility. It takes a fair bit to get shorthorn breeders pissed off. And I think whilst that's a wonderful human trait, it's also frustrating because we need to be getting out more, becoming more vocal. And, um, and that leads to the second point about tell the story. We've got to tell the story on shorthorns. As Professor said, uh, you know, shorthorns were here originally in Australia, in, in New Zealand. Uh, what did you say? They didn't have to be... They weren't bred up. They weren't bred up, correct. They weren't bred up. And so much we take for granted is, is a new story to cattle producers. And if we took the bottom of that... I'll just go back to that slide. If we go back to the bottom of that slide, and they're the things that we start thumping all around the world about what the shorthorn traits are, and then we do it well enough, and it doesn't have to be expensive exercise. That's what I was alluding to yesterday with the internet. But we've got to tell the message. We've got to make it happen, get out there and get it to go. <clears throat> and that means having articles in little godforsaken newspapers across Australia and America or Canada or Ireland or whatever. We've got to be actually chasing business. Business doesn't come this to us easily. Business is ultra competitive. Listening to the PBB talk this morning, you know, this is an ultra competitive business in pedigreed cattle now. And if it's competitive for the pedigreed breeder, it's even more so for the commercial breeder because they look at the bank balance. And unless the bank balance stacks up, they're not going to be in whatever breed it is. We've got the point there. The greater role for the World Shorthorn Council, and I'll readily admit I was pretty much oblivious to the role of the World Shorthorn Council. Um, put a conference every three years, that was it. But the more I sat here yesterday and the more I talked to people and the more I listened to opinions and I suppose following on a bit about my talk with, with emails and the internet and all the rest of it, we really have to drive the World Shorthorn Council and that is no way a reflection on what's happened in the past. Uh, please don't take it as that at all. But the World Shorthorn Council is obviously a small organisation working on limited funds so we as, breed, as members of the World Shorthorn Council if we're going to make it happen, we need to do it. We need to be building people's confidence in that telling the story. So maybe, you know, it's probably maybe a major leap of faith in some cases, but if the World Shorthorn Council had the database of, of members' email addresses for everyone across this room across the world, and every three months they sent out even one newsletter just saying what's happening around the world. Just, and I know it works because I do it in the Drover's Journal, simply to find something to write every Sunday. But if it was coming from the World Shorthorn Council, and that's a bit like the parents telling the kids what's going on when they're away at boarding school. And I think that's something we have to look at pretty closely. We've got to change our culture, and I think this is a major issue from being maybe winners to winning expectation. As I said last night, and I, I wasn't being a smart ass when I said it, the, ex, the expectation on the rugby field of the All Blacks is that they're gonna win. The expectation of everyone else is they hope they can beat the All Blacks. Um, and that hurt a bit saying that, but it's truth. Um, but it is, that's the reality of it. We've got to change the culture of our breeders. Instead of being apologists, they have to stand tall when they breed short horns. But we've got to give them a reason to stand tall. You know, as I said uh, yesterday, it's, it's in a lot of cases it's like wearing a blue suit and wetting your pants. It gives you a warm feeling and no one notices. So we've got to get out there and be able to show that to the people why they should be backing short ones. Because everyone, I don't care who you are, everyone likes to back a winner. And if people can be perceived that short ones are now on a winner, and we, we've been here for 200 years in New Zealand, we've had a hiatus period, membership numbers uh, have dropped back, but that's no reason to say, oh, it can't happen. It can happen. Everyone that's concerned with short on cattle all get out of bed in the morning, go to the toilet, have a shower and go to work. They're all human beings. So we can make it happen. We've just got to believe in it. We've got to bring, it, bring our people with us. Um, in the Second World War, my father was in the 9th Division uh, in, in the British 8th Army that fought Rommel in the Western Desert. He was a rat of Tobruk. And one of the men he admired most of all was his enemy in Erwin Rommel because Every time they caught Germans, the German troops spoke of Rommel in, in near, uh, well, heroic terms, but adoration of the, of the man. Um, and such was it, apparently, 
uh, when he was forced to commit suicide by Hitler that the, the Eighth Army actually sent a plane over Mannheim where he's buried in Germany to drop a wreath. Was it all worked out that he wasn't going to get shot down. But the point was that Rommel took his people with him. He told them what was going on. Montgomery did the same thing. They knew what was happening. We as executives or you know, power people within a breed in our country, we also need to let our people know what we're doing and more importantly why we're doing it. Because it's all too easy to accept negativity. You know, and things that piss me off in life are people that lie and people are negative. Just yeah, make, let's make it happen, but bring our people with us. Make them feel part of it. And that comes back to communication. It comes back to emails. It, it means turning up at, you know, every time an envelope's open, there's someone there who knows what's going on to be able to spread the message. And as that message gets better and better, and we've seen a, a real rise in, in Australia in the last 18 months when we started to get some really solid feedlot wins, all of a sudden our breeders are starting to get a little bit more cocky, a little bit more confident that they might be able to say something. Now, hopefully... Uh, by the time 2013 rolls over, we'll have had a lot more of those commercial wins that are important to commercial producers. But if, as you get your own results in your own countries, for goodness sake, tell us. Because, it, you know, speaking now as editor of the Drover's Journal, if I get something from Charles in Argentina that says Shorthorn's had a big win doing something other commercially, I'll run it. So the more my readers, of which half an hour overseas are non-Australians, they read that and then they go, hey, geez, we were on a good thing, this thing's starting to move. So it's all perception because perception's reality, but we've got to bring our people with us. We've got to give them ownership of the breed. The big trap, the big trap breed societies and businesses fall into is that they don't give the people working for them. A, a definition of leadership given to me some years ago by fellow Carlos Moresca, who's probably one of my mentors in public speaking. His definition of leadership was having others do what you want for their reasons. Right? So we need to be able to get the people who breed short horns to come with us because of what they want. And if they can get that, then we're going to get our position as leaders of the breed to make it a, a, not only a profitable but a climbing up the ladder of success. So we need to understand about what they want in the breed. We've got to communicate with them. If you're going to be a committee or a board or a council that sits up there, God-given rule, I'll tell you, you're about to fall ass over because the people won't go with you. But you get them involved in it and what they say may well not change your mind, but they feel like they've contributed to it. And that's a critical part of it. And especially, you know, you look at sporting cultures, how many teams around the world, be it rugby or soccer or whatever, have had a pretty ordinary career and all of a sudden uh, a coach gets hold of them and he starts to listen to them and they feel like they're putting input. When they have a win, they think it's because of what they inputted. It was probably because of the coach's skill, but they believe they were the ones that created it. And it's just, a, it's just an almighty powerful force. Saying there, apparently it's an old Alaskan saying, unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. So unless you get the front, you're looking at another dog's ass all the way through the trip. So unless we become the lead dog, we're never going to have a different view. And we can become the lead dog. You see, that's, uh, you know, there's a, a wonderful series of ads that I think Bert's got on the uh, American Short on Association ads at the bottom of it. And this will please all of you Angus fellas there. But they, they, are, they are fallible. I mean, I can remember back in the... You know, I've been auctioneering 50 years in June. Uh, it was half a century. Jesus, I'm starting to slide. How old are you? <laughs> yeah, not 50, are you? No, that's right. Yeah, I remember when. It's, uh, yeah. Um, but when we used to sell, in the days when the Royal Easter Show was a proper bull sale, and there were 600 odd bulls went up for sale over three and a half days, the half day was comprised of Angus, Devon, Santa Gertrudis, and a few Charolais. And we used to joke we'd sell them by the tail. You'd pick them up and sell them by the bundle because they were little cattle. The Argentinian factor that I think Ted alluded to earlier on. Now, that breed has gone in, in that period from there to being market leaders. Now, somewhere along the line, someone clicked into gear and picked up and marketed a lot of the traits that short ones have got anyway. Is that a fair comment? Yep. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> but, that, but that's the point. We've got the bloody traits here. We don't have to reinvent them, for God's sake. If it was something we had to pull out of a hat, that's a different story. And, and dairy short ones and milking short ones, to me, are, are, are absolute symbol of that conundrum in the breed. Now, I talk dairy short ones in Australia to some of the short horn breeders. Oh, I don't want them to bugger up my EBVs. And yet here we are, if you've got a milking, lack of milk in your herd, here's the solution. As you said, we don't have to crank them up. They're already here. We own them. So why don't we blend in more with what we've got? 
Um, and I, I, you know, and I've, here's my frustration with the, with the dairy short on blokes, and I'll probably get thumped after this talk for this. But, you know, as I understand it in Australia, we've pretty much got a core left of pure dairy short on blood, I'm, and I'm happy to be taken to task if I'm wrong there. So instead of saying, let's keep it together, why don't we market it? Why don't we push that as being the a font of the purity in the world? And once again, the internet, uh, I think you may have discussed it with um, um, barriers coming down on semen trade or whatever else, these sorts of things. Yeah, the world is changing fast. Unless we change with it, we're not going to be there. Uh, and I, as I see it, and I'm, I'm not a prophet of doom by any stretch because I think the breed has an enormous future, but we've got a time span. Unless we can make this happen in three or four years, then we are on the roll. And that's not meant to put the wind up yet. But having said that, this is one of the most famous sporting photos of all time. That was Muhammad Ali when he decked Sonny Liston in the first round. Um, I don't know what he said to him, but Liston didn't appreciate it. <laughs> And the question I always ask is, which one will we be by Uruguay 2016? Are we going to be the fellow standing at the top on the way up or we flatten the deck, knocked ass over and over? So that then brings me back to the quote that I used yesterday of Lawrence of Arabia, is that all men dream but not equally, for the dreamers the night awakened to find it was merely their vanity, but the dreamers of the day are the dangerous ones, for they dream with their eyes open and they make things happen. As I said to you yesterday, and I'll say it to you again today, the challenge for us is to become dreamers of the day and to make it happen. Because we can do it, we've got the product, we've got the people with the belief, we just need to get more fire in them and become more active and positive. And I'd also like to, in fact, that's the end of my rattle, but to thank Bill and Judy and the committee here was has been an absolutely fantastic conference. I mean, I wasn't on the tour part, but everyone I've spoken to has had an absolute ball, as you would expect when you're in New Zealand. Um, and I dip my lid to the quality of the speakers and just the whole organisation. It's been fantastic. And thank you very much for inviting me. I've had a great time.